taken the opportunity on this visit to Los Angeles to speak to you on world peace and revolt in Africa. These subjects, together with that of the problems of minorities in the United States, form, in fact, one problem when brought together and viewed in unity. It is that task which I ask you to permit me to essay tonight and to approach it from the point of view of what we usually call the Negro problems. All so-called social problems tend to merge. They all have to do with human actions and are based on human customs and treat the numerous and intricate relations of human beings. Moreover, particular social problems, despite the names they bear, change and change radically in the course of time. Indeed, social problems change more often and in more ways than physical problems because of the unpredictable variations in human feelings and choices. They are subject to the same physical laws as sticks and stones, but there is enough of what we call will and volition to make it necessary for persons who are studying a human problem are trying to conduct their action in accordance with its present manifestations to keep a weary eye on changes and on current facts. For instance, in the United States during the young manhood of Frederick Douglass, the Negro problem was the problem of slavery. There were, of course, minor and connected problems but they were all subjected to the main problem of human freedom. Then rather suddenly, between 1863 and 1876, the Negro problem became a problem of political enfranchisement and party government, which rapidly descended into race war, leading to temporary attempts to grapple with problems of work and education. But finally, ending in practical disfranchisement of the entire Negro race in the South in 1876. From 1876 until our day, the race problem in the United States of the Negro has been primarily a struggle to regain the right to vote in the midst of caste discrimination, changing slowly but definitely to a problem of the right to work and to be trained for work at all levels, and to a struggle for broad civil and social rights. Most of you, I think, assume that this is still the Negro problem. But you must be warned that it is not wholly or mainly that now. That the reason that it is not is because of the fundamental changes now spreading over the whole world. Whereas in the 18th century, the world thought that progress and emancipation were coming from popular education and universal suffrage, we know now that more fundamental than these important rights is the economic organization of the world. That is, the way in which the labor of human beings is organized to satisfy human needs. This question is so fundamental that all other questions of political power, of education, and human happiness depend upon it. This is the basic reason for the rise of philanthropy, of socialism, and the attempt at complete realization of socialism through communism. It is immaterial whether or not you like or accept socialism or communism the absolute compulsion of your facing the problem which they try to solve is inescapable. While I am sure most of you realize this worldwide change of emphasis, I doubt if you see how this affects the Negro problem in the United States. Because most American Negroes of education and property have long since 
oversimplified their problem and tried to separate it from all other social problems. They conceive that their fight is simply to have the same rights and privileges as other American citizens. They do not for a moment stop to question how far the organization of work and distribution of wealth in America is perfect, nor do they for a moment conceive that the economic organization of America may have fundamental injustices and shortcomings which seriously affect not only Negroes, but the whole world. Just as Booker Washington in his day assumed that American ideals were complete and right, that all we had to do was to fight to imitate and attain them, so today, we Negroes are largely quite swept away by the miracles of American industry, the huge accumulation of wealth, and the conspicuous expenditure which we find about us. Our idea of heaven is to be rich Americans, to make the kind of show in home, dress, and automobiles that is so popular in America, and to suffer in our effort to do these things that we should be able to do them with no discrimination on account of race or color. This is dangerously short-sighted. We American Negroes are part of the working force of the world. Not only do we represent an important segment of the American working class, but also of the working classes of Europe, Asia, and Africa, and the other Americas. In these days of uncertainty, we have to live and here in the United States, where for many, it is difficult to earn a living without selling one's soul to falsehood and greed. And that was...